All right, I want to welcome everybody out to Biz Ninja Entrepreneur Radio. Wherever you're listening or watching, I appreciate you. And uh, we've got a guest today who is, uh, if you've been in the ClickFunnels or internet marketing world for very long, uh, you've probably heard of Trey Llewellyn. And so I want to welcome Trey out and uh, really grateful, willing to come out on the show. Absolutely. I think you were at the Dream 100 and you're like, you want to do a podcast? I said, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We've, uh, you know, it's fun. Our, our paths have crossed several times. We have a lot of mutual friends. Um, mm. And you, I think, are like Funnel Hacker episode one. So anybody that's watched <laughs> uh, some of the older uh, videos from, from Russell, like they can't not know Trey Llewellyn and the amazing wolf oil funnel, like or gun oil funnel, right? So, yep. um, but, still, you know, still running. still running that thing. That's amazing. What's amazing to me about that is that you've given away probably 10,000 copies of that funnel and you're still crushing it. Yeah. Yeah. I think we had, um, I think we had somebody else just kind of like copy it verbatim and then put their own oil. But from what I can tell, there's no like real copiers yet, which is fine, which is cool, which is nice. I mean, they modeled it and then, you know, went and did their own thing, but, um, but it does work. I mean, all it is is a concept. Right. right. And so as long as they know, they understand the concept, then they can model it with anything. They can model it with pins or books or TVs or whatever you want to do. And so going into that concept, you weren't always an e-commerce guy, right? You, you were originally an insurance salesman. Um, mm -hmm. How did you first like get into <laughs> deciding you were going to do sell products online? Um, you know, so I was an electrical engineer before I was an insurance agent. Okay. And I got my degree in insurance our insurance in electrical engineering. And then I was an engineer for a year, probably less than, and I decided that was not for me because I saw the 50 year olds, right? The 60 year olds. And I said, that's going to be me. So I'm out. So then I became an insurance agent and I was there for three years and they, they called me into headquarters because I was doing things that they didn't want me to do, such as, uh, you know, drive down the street with a video camera rolling and talk about driving or talk about my life. And I was just trying to be a spokesperson of, you know, I'm trying to get out to the world. And they came down hard and they're like, Hey, you can't be doing that. You're an insurance agent. You can't be taking video and driving at the same time. If you got an accident, that wouldn't really look good on our part. I couldn't do Facebook posts, couldn't do Facebook ads. So I was really restricted by a lot of things. And they called me down to headquarters, had to drive down there. And they pretty much, the writing was on the wall that I was getting fired probably in the next, you know, two or three months. And so when they came in and did fire me, I, I quit on the same day. So I don't really know if I quit or they fired me, but it was like one of those <laughs> mutual separations, like right. yes, not anymore. But what was cool was during that time, uh, I was learning about things. I was going to like events like traffic and conversion. And, uh, I was, I was, I was learning Facebook ads and I was doing loan officer leads for loan officers. I was building home calculators through funnels. Okay. And then from there I was just creating leads. And that's kind of where it started. But then I realized doing that, I, I hated doing done for you work because it was always my freaking fault if Facebook would crash or okay. if a funnel didn't operate in, on one day. Like it was my fault and I had no control, but they didn't understand that. Right. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go be my own thing. I'm going to sell my own stuff. And I didn't really have any products to sell. And I was watching a, uh, I was watching a webinar Tanner Larson was doing one night. I was, I, I remember I had like my little kid. I, I think, I think Liam was maybe six months or seven months. I don't know. I was, he's sitting right next to me. I'm trying to, like, he's crying. I'm trying to watch Tanner's, Tanner's webinar of how he's selling shirts and, uh, and was watching all that. And then I said, man, that, that seems pretty easy. I think I can do something like that. And so I started doing what he kind of demonstrated on the webinar and through his training. And I went and sold, I don't even know what it came out to be, maybe like 50 or 60,000 shirts over the next six or seven months. And that really got me in the, in, into the product world, I guess. And yeah, uh, what we started finding was we were so dang good at shirts that we were selling a new shirt every week. And we were so dang good at it that the freaking comments coming in said, hey man, I bought the last 10 shirts from you. Uh, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> and the writing was kind of on the wall. And so we had, to, we had to go to in the physical world, the physical product world of different items, which opens up a massive ocean of products, right? More than, more than just t-shirts, but t-shirts still sell to this day. And that's when I kind of heard about this thing called a Canton Fair. Like what in the world is that? It's in China of all scary places. Like couldn't they, like China to me is like North Korea, right? You're like, just like, you can't go there. Right. And 
we bought tickets, Bryce and I, he was afraid because he couldn't bring his gun. And I said, you know what, either we die or live, but we'll find something over there. <laughs> and we took the trip, couldn't wait to get back because it was so just, it was just, a, it was the wild, wild west over there. You don't know anything. You, no one knows, speaks English, so you're just totally out of right. the zone. But uh, man, what an experience of what the Canton Fair was to see all these hundreds of thousands of products. And we've been going ever since, you know, and it's been, it, it, and every year it's gotten better and more relaxed. And we like, okay, we know where the hotel is. We know where, where real food is. We know how to kind of core it, you know, we know how to say hello and, and toilet and, you know, like yeah. get me the hell out of here kind of stuff. Yeah. So it's been intriguing. So that was kind of like how we stair step through into physical products. So, yeah. So tra tracing that backwards a little bit, essentially you got in, you started learning the basics of marketing, internet marketing by doing the leads. Um, and then you realized you needed to sell your own thing. You found your first uh, digital mentor, right? By watching somebody else telling you how to sell shirts. And so you went all in on that to start. I mean, most guys, there's a lot of guys that dabble in that business, but don't move 50,000 units. Um, and I mean, t-shirts are still one of the things that still come up today is the first thing that you can start with and the first product. Sure. Um, so what was your first, in that first iteration of like, okay, you guys are an e-commerce company now. What was the first big hurdle or like obstacle that you guys hit and how did you guys overcome it? Oh, I know exactly what the obstacles were. So we're sitting down at this event. I, 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 I could afford, I finally could afford like a mastermind to attend. And I, and I go down and mentor with these guys. And I'm in a room of, I don't know, 12 or 15 people. And I'm the, I'm the dumbest person in the room. I'm the weakest. I'm the most broke dude in the room. But I, you know, you don't want to tell anybody, you know, you're like fake it till you make it kind of deal. I was like faking it. Right. And uh, I'm just listening to these guys numbers. Like, Hey, how much do you want to make per month? And the guy says, Oh, you know, we'll probably do 300, $400,000 this month. I'm just like, Whoa. Next guy, you know, say something like a million dollars. He wants to do a million dollars this month. They just did 700,000. Now he wants to do a million. I'm just like, Whoa. And then for, I don't know for shits and giggles, they saved me for last. And I'm saying, you know, uh, I'd be ecstatic with $5,000 minimum you know, coming on. And we, what it was, was we created this MTO, which was minimum target outrageous. And your M is your minimum, no matter what happens, no matter if, you know, your merchant account goes down, no matter if your funnel goes down, no matter if you're sick for a week, no matter what your company is going to make that minimum. And my minimum was five grand. And the next question was, well, what's your target? Like, where do you want to go? Where do you want to be? Where do you want to see? And I set my target for $15,000. And then came the big audacious, the hairy, you know, the BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. And I set mine for 60,000. And why 60,000? I, I actually had a reason for the numbers. The, the 60,000 was how much I was making as an insurance agent. I made $60,000 a year. And I said, you know, if I can, if I can make the same amount of money that I, I do in, in 12 months in one month, dude, that would just be outrageous to me. Like that would just be absurd, insane. The world turned upside down kind of feel. Right. And so I put it up on a board, not thinking anything of it. And then miss my good friend, Rob Cosberg, now to this day, love the dude. And he's sitting right next to me. He's holding this water bottle. And he goes, Trey, how are you going to get from 5,000 to 15,000? And I go, well, I guess we could raise our, our Facebook ad. And he goes, well, how much are you spending right now a day? I said, around $10. I was that guy in the Facebook group, right? <laughs> I'm, the, I'm that guy. Like, hey, man, I, I spent $10 on Facebook today. I made no conversions, no purchases. That was me. And he goes, well, how are you going to get the 15 grand? I said, oh, well, you know, raise the Facebook ad. And he goes, well, how much? And I said, 20 bucks. And he literally, in one moment, just takes his wallet and just drops it. And then he goes, followed by, whoa. <laughs> Right. It makes me feel super small in front of this massive room. And I still didn't get it. I still didn't get it. And I go, I don't know, $30. And he goes, man, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. Go and scale that thing. Go and see what it can bring to you. And dude, I, I tell you like that guy changed my life. You know, I still talk to him to this day of how he pushed me. And I went back and I told my brother who didn't, who didn't attend the mastermind. And I, I come back, I'm like, we're going to go crazy. 
we're just going to scale it. I said, I don't know what's going to happen. We might go broke. We probably will be in a lot of debt and probably homeless within the next two days, but we're going to go for it. And we went for it. And over the next two months, we went from doing five grand to, I think the next month we did like 30 grand. Next month that we did about uh, $45,000. And then the following month into May, we did $117,000 in t-shirt sales. And we sold over whatever that backs out to be of $20, $20 a shirt or something like that. But it was a lot of shirts. And just the problems through that even, I, I call it this jet stream and, and how I can relate to it visually is if you, if you ever watched uh, Nemo and right. the turtles, remember the, remember the scene with the turtles? Of course. And, and the dad and Nemo or Merlin and Nemo are riding on the turtles and they're in the Atlantic current or something like that, the East Atlantic current. There it is. It's going so fast, right? Yep. And they're going so fast. And then you just like one of the turtles like pops out of the, the current. And he's like, boom, they go, he like goes way back. And that, how I look at that is that's the world. That's like regular day life. But then there's these things that we can just kind of morph into this current and boom, you're in this jet stream. And that's what it literally felt like when we started selling these shirts. I even have, I have a picture this day because I want to remember it, but there's a picture. I didn't have any furniture. I didn't have any stuff on the walls. I just had a screen, TV screen about this big behind me on the wall. And I made it to where it was, uh, it was through the Apple TV and it was refreshing every, every minute or every 30 seconds because we wanted to watch the last couple hours of the sales ending. And the shirts are just spinning. I mean, they are just selling like bananas. It was the most absurd thing. And we couldn't spend enough money. We couldn't spend enough money. I, I had a credit card that had a limit of $2,000. And then Facebook at that time limited you to $1,000 a day. So right. what the limit was. Now Facebook's, you know, full bore, like you don't care. But it right. was that. So what was happening is every day I was hitting that cap of $1,000. I'm like, Facebook, let me spend more. And then every two days I was capping out my credit card and I was waiting for my, mer and I, we didn't have any cash. So I had to go pay it off, pay the merchant off to redo the cash. I'm borrowing cash to go pay off the credit card to get the Facebook ad back on. So it's this massive just ups and downs and like you're this whirlwind of energy and all these sales and then it all comes to an end at the very like last moment, of course, like, you know, we sold however many shirts. It was just like, wow, that was a freaking ride. It was amazing. But there was, you know, there was hard times during that. There was times where it was a little, it was a lot of whew, like, I don't know if we can, if this is going to go so well, because we got, well, I think, I mean, what's funny is what you just described to the, to most people you would describe as hard times. I mean, a lot of those problems to many people are enough that they stop, right? Well, I'm out of money on the credit card and you're saying, okay, how do I pay it off and get it like on a daily basis? You're, you're like using your credit card as a revolving line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're getting, you have, and I think that's one of the major differences between entrepreneurs who make it and entrepreneurs who continue to struggle. And it's the ability to consistently and repetitively solve problems like quickly, right? They just keep coming. You just solve them, move forward. Don't bury too much energy into them. Yeah. Um, Cause you know, I've heard your, I've heard several different parts of your story and every one of them has hurdles, right? And it has challenges that could have stopped somebody else. Right. And mm -hmm. so uh, what do you think is different about like you or about entrepreneurs that, that causes us to, uh, to be, so thick headed that we just keep overcoming, keep, keep solving the problem. <laughs> uh, man, I think Jim Rohn kind of uh, answers that. And I've been listening to a lot of him lately. And he says, you know, there's, there's, there's certain desires. I think there's a little Jim Rohn and it's a little think and grow rich, a little Napoleon Hill together. But people that have and know their desire are the ones that have a purpose. And the cool thing about that is not everybody has that, right? And some do, some don't. Some get it, some don't. Some create it, some don't. But that's the, that's the wonders of the world, is that's the wonders of the mind. Like, there is, I don't know if there is a reason or a solution. That's, it's just, it is because it is. Right. You know, he talks about the people who are doubters, right? The people who doubt that they can do anything. Well, don't, don't. Don't 
make them someone else. They're the doubters. We call them doubters because that's who they are. They're doubters, right? right. They'll never be anybody, <laughs> anybody else than that. And then he calls, you know, the liars. Like, don't try to have a, have a liar tell the truth. They're liars, right? That's what they do. They right. lie, <laughs> you know? So, and then it's just like us. We're the entrepreneurs. We're entrepreneurs. We have desire. We have purpose. We have drive. It's who we are. So I was watching a show yesterday and uh, there was a line that said out that stood out to me and they said geography equals destiny. And it was uh, from the new Jack Ryan series on Amazon. Right? And they were talking, he was talking about like, Hey, he was born in one country. So he's, he's not a good guy. Right. And, um, but the point was that, and I thought it was really fascinating is to connect that to what you've been saying now is I've always been fascinated by how uh, the entrepreneur, like our paradigms can shift. Mm -hmm. Right. You went to that one mastermind that Rob was at thinking that 60,000 was this huge, you know, like the top end of your paradigm at the time. Oh, totally. Right? And then in that one mastermind, you're shifted. Right. And I remember I was actually, so I was at a dinner with you and with Rob, uh, at funnel hacking live in Dallas. And I was talking with them and had kind of some of those same moments. You came over and told a story about, uh, Stripe not being very friendly to you with one of your, with your membership sit, sit, uh, set up. And your answer there, and you can share that story if you, if you want, uh, but your answer of how you were going to handle that and not try to save it, instead just focus on rebuilding uh, a better brand, completely like shifted the way I looked at problems at that time. I'm like, man, why would why go back and just keep band-aiding something when you can create something better, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe you want to touch on that story because I think it's if you're willing to share it, it's pretty powerful. The uh, the, the challenge that you had to overcome there in your continuity program. Uh, which part? Cause there's, there's <laughs> you probably had a couple of them. So, uh, when you, your guys is, uh, your continuity program behind your, the oil and your different funnels, right? Stripe basically came in and, and, fr and shut down all of those, all of that recurring revenue. Oh, that part. Yeah. yeah. I thought you meant the part where they held one point two million dollars, but you wanted that part. Okay. It, I think it's all part of the same fun roller coaster that you probably dealt with. There's a dude. That was, that was a little intense. So, so the reason why it all happened was because uh, we couldn't fulfill fast enough, and we got in this big old loophole of, of badness. But basically, we had seventy thousand orders in in um, uh, overdue. Let's see trying to put it all together because we, yeah, no yeah, we, were, we were 70 we we're 70 thousand orders in the hole they're supposed to go out in december we they weren't going out until february and so people these were like christmas gifts and stuff yeah. like that you know that people are buying and and we're we're getting fifteen thousand phone calls a day i had four people to answer those phone calls so realistically i can only handle about 400 calls we were receiving fifteen thousand, and we're, we're into this, you know, pretty deeply. We're hiring other, other call centers to take the calls and they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're saying like, oh, your order will be there tomorrow. Click next, next phone call. When realistically the order is about five weeks out, six weeks out. Right. So anyways, that creates a big havoc in, in the world of, of merchants and credit cards and stuff like that. And so we're sitting there and instead, you know, the first line of defense is to call the customer support, right? Which is us. They can't get a hold of us. Our line's busy, never answers. Next line of support, call the bank. So they call the bank, they do a charge back on the account and they get their money back. And so now uh, we're out of those funds and then we, we, don't, we, we don't even know because we've printed off stacks of orders and literally I'm not exaggerating. This might be a stack of just, you know, some sort of product and the next product or oil or targets or whatever. And if they're charging back, we're still shipping it, right? Because there's no way to go and find, catching it. There's no way to go and find that order when that massive stack of paper that we already printed out. And there's no way we're printing it all over again. And so we're just like, we're just gonna even ship it out no matter what. And then because of how many chargebacks we received in a given amount of time, um, we started getting fined. And we were obviously when you get a chargeback, you're charged thirty dollars per transaction per chargeback. And and that all goes to the merchant that's handling the transaction. Right. And then on top of that, if you uh, go beyond that amount of, of a percentage of a threshold, then the, the big boys come in, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, Discover. And what they do is they charge a fee, chargeback fee on top of the 30. And that's around 100 bucks. It's exactly $100. 
So now for every charge back that comes in, we owe $30 and then we owe an additional $100. Plus losing the initial money. Yes. And, and the affiliate payout. <laughs> and shipping the product. So yes. your cost of goods, your cost of acquisition, and it's all massive. of the finance costs of the uh, of massive. This penalty. Massive. Matt, we're talking lots of money. <laughs> yeah, that adds up. Uh, yeah. So it sucked, but you know you get through it. And then, and then when you get to an even higher threshold of chargebacks, then Mastercard and Visa come in and they fine you um, around three hundred thousand dollars each party. And so now you have $30 chargebacks, $100 chargebacks, and $300,000 and another $300,000 fine on top of that because of the, the, just the earthquake that's happening. And it's nothing that we did wrong, per se. We couldn't keep up with the freaking orders. Right. We just couldn't keep up. We had, yeah, it, we wasn't, had, it wasn't fraudulent or uh, deceitful. It just was the campaign was overly successful. It was, oh, yeah, well, all campaign, campaigns combined, right? We're overly right. successful. Uh, we had all of our recurring income uh, continuity members inside uh, of Stripe. And those were, those were at like 30 bucks a month. We had 10,000 of those. So that was, I think we're bringing in like 300 grand a month or something like that. And then when, when Stripe shut us down, um, they, they took all those people too. And that was a good lesson to learn is that you should always have uh, the credit card in like a CRM or so, some sort of system. And that way you can train track the system to a different merchant. Like, so if you went to authorize.net today, Tomorrow you can go through NMI. The next day you can go through PayPal. The next day you can go through ClickBank. The next day you can go through Stripe. The next day you can go through, you know, whatever the next one yeah. is. And you can go through all those. And there's a dozen. Shopping cart pro. I mean, shoot, there's all kinds of stuff, right? right? And like that was a big, big aha to me is we put all this work. And the one thing that I learned really quickly is I only control what I own. And I did not own the customer data, credit card, uh, the renewal. I didn't own any of that. Didn't own any of it because it was all stored in one place. And so once I was smarter, <laughs> more inclined, right? I moved, we moved it all. We had to start all over. We had to start from scratch. We lost everything and we were rock bottom. We didn't have any income coming in, but we had one thing and this is what saved the company for probably the next six to eight months. And that was our database, our database of emails, our database of addresses, and our database of phone numbers. With that database, we were able to make phone calls. We were able to email out and mail out offers, new programs, upsells, downsells. And with what we were able to do with that uh, monetization system, kept the company afloat for the next six to eight months. And we were able to kind of get back on our feet. We were able to kind of get going again but it was rough it was yeah. it was exciting but it was rough it was stressful sleepless nights uh you know heartache because we had to lay off people right uh, we had to hire people and it was just you know it's it's nothing that anyone ever wants to go through or do but it was more of an education than than anything that absolutely uh, I, that i received from that that no one, no one can educate you on what I was educated on through experience. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a ride for sure. Yeah, and what's interesting, so I, I've gone through like small versions of that, right? You just take off zeros from everything you've done, and uh, but it it hurts the same, right? And it's stressful the same, and the and the sleepless nights happen. And I think what's so fascinating is, uh, is you know that we do share, right? It's important for us to share that and be like, okay, hey, this is the pain point. This is what I learned, you know, controlling your data, uh, you know, protecting where, you know, having a strategy of how you're actually tra doing transactions, right? As opposed to just, well, I'm set up here and that's the default payment gateway. So I guess I'll just do that, right? Actually thinking beyond all of the defaults, I think would be the way I say that. Yeah. But, I'll, give you, um, I'll give you, you a know, secret to that if you yeah. want. Yeah, please. So, the biggest thing that I learned, or one of the things I learned from that was a question that I ask myself frequently now, is of all the systems that we currently have going on, can they be multiplied by a thousand? And if so, is it sustainable? Interesting. Just look at that. So if right now we're getting 100 calls and we instantly tomorrow scale to a thousand calls, 
Can we handle it? If we can't handle it, how, what breaks? What starts breaking? What starts melting? What's the biggest havoc that's going to happen? And so by asking yourself that question, you can actually create systems that kind of give you cushion, enough cushion that you're ready for the next big thing. I'll give you another, a great example would be is we had, we had two, two offices. One office was shipping all of our product and then it was connected just not through a doorway. You'd have to go around the parking lot. And then the other office was our, our phone room and marketing room. That's where we're kind of creating the sales and then they're shipping out on the other side. So what was happening was we would get a phone call. The phone room would get a phone call. This is how screwed up this thing was. We'd get a phone call and they'd be like, hey, um, it's my son's birthday tomorrow. I need my order shipped today. No ifs, ands, or buts. Ship it. And so they would get into the, into the dude's ear, right? And just convince him, hypnotically persuade him to hang up the phone and say, yep, got it. They would take a sticky note of all things, write down, you know, Bob Smith needs his order tomorrow, ASAP, ship out right now. They would get up from their seat, go out the front door, walk around the building into the shipping department and stick the sticky note on the manager's desk of the shipping department and say, Bob needs his order tomorrow. Make sure you ship it out. So then all the shipping agents would stop, go over and make Bob's order, make sure it got shipped out, and then go back into production. And this was happening over and over and over again to where it was such nonsense. And it's just like, stressful it's like what is like we don't have a system for people who are calling in like i'm like no one has their order everybody's bob smith everybody needs an asap right <laughs> unfortunately bob is not different in this case right now because everybody needs their order so we need to do it in a in an orderly fashion and first come first serve we get them out and yeah we're, we're two months behind guys like that's that's what you guys say if they want a refund give them a refund but right now we just gotta get these get all these orders out and man i tell you what like you learn a lot by scaling quickly of, of how things can scale really fast, but uh, so much stuff starts to break that you weren't even prepared for because it ran at a much lower level. As you kind of said, like take a couple zeros off. Well, it, it runs a little easier. It runs a little smoother. You can talk to Mike over here and be like, Mike, Jimmy's on the phone. He needs an order. Mike's like, got it. I'll ship that out right now. Right. But then when you got a thousand Jimmy's calling and you're like, Mike, a thousand Jimmy's are on the phone. I need a thousand orders going out. Things get a little more complicated. Yeah, you start going through a lot of post-it notes at that point. You're flying through post-it <laughs> notes, man. Like you become a post-it note machine. And, and the other thing was that, that I learned really well was don't overcomplicate the funnel. And that's why I started building uh, what I call today reactive funnels. That was my net. That was, uh, that's all my list of questions. So teach us about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so reactive funnels are basically um, designed with artificial intelligence. They make decisions depend on depending on how, you know, how the user interacts with the, with the order form and the upsells and downsells. But at the end of the day, when I was doing some of my funnels, dude, I was throwing in all kinds of crazy stuff. Like for tar, like I'd have, let's say the oil, oil example. So you got oil and then I would do like a brush and then, you know, a kit and then, I don't know, some sort of staple gun and then some targets and then just random stuff that I could just stuff in this funnel. I was just stuffing funnels. And it was just monotonous, crazy. But what, it, what, what I was really doing is I was increasing the complexity of my business by 12x. Rockefeller habits, the habits of Rockefeller says that by every one skew you add to your business, you increase the complexity by 12x, the logistics, the shipping manifest, the marketing, your, 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 your POV, your you know, point of view, your, your SOP, your sales positioning, like the KPIs you're watching, like, dude, everything becomes super complex. It's ridiculous. And I did exactly that. <laughs> I had, I had products of products of products in a funnel, but what that did was that created a nth factor of ways people could order. Right. So one dude would order 10 targets and a bottle of oil. Another dude would order 30 targets and two bottles of order. Another dude would order two, two targets, uh, a bottle of order, uh, oil, and then like, I don't know, a, a stapler. Well, dude, that makes everything crazy complex because when you have a thousand orders and every single one of those is different, the, 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 the line slows completely to a still standstill. I'm talking 
five minutes to get an order out. So I would right. time the boxes. How long does it take to get an order out? Five minutes, five minutes when it was that complex. But when it was one oil, like we'd have a thousand one oil, oils, right? Those are, we're doing, we're doing an order probably every 15 seconds. So we had 20 people lined up. We could do an order every 20, 20, 15 and 20 seconds. As soon as we went into a complex funnel, it slowed the line down to five minutes in order. Wow. Five minutes in order. Dude, tore us up. Tore us up. The whole logistics blew up because we scaled by 1,000 and weren't ready. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't know the complexity behind it. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> right. We just, we just did it. Just figuring it out, right. You know? And so now you, you use, like, the, the process is more simple, more linear, more logical. What's the major, major shift? Less SKUs. Okay. So with a reactive funnel, we might sell two different SKUs. That's it. But that SKU might be comprised of a couple of different products. No, it's two oh. products. Yeah, two SKUs, two products. Yeah, very, very, very slim, neat. Um, you know, it, it's very, it just, it just runs very smoothly. So I'll the, give three, you the 300 upsells, 200 downsells, and uh, all that kind of stuff. That. You don't do that anymore. Keep it simple. None, none of that. No, and we keep it extremely simple. So I'll give you an example is, you know, something that we do in our funnels is we sell whatever we sell on the order form page. doesn't matter if it's a shoe, a jump rope, a coffee mug, a book, whatever. The upsell is the same exact product just for a little bit of a different price. Okay. Yep. And we'll convert, we'll convert at 20 to 30% on that. Now the thing is, is people are like, well, well, why would they buy another coffee mug when they just said they wanted five coffee mugs? They don't need any more coffee mugs. They said they only need five. Why would they buy more? And I got this from when my mom went to, uh, to Chicago to, to the apple orchard. We spent the whole day out in this darn apple orchard, right? Picking apples, eating apples, right. looking at apples, stepping on apples, throwing apples. Everything you can do with an apple, we did with an apple. And we bring back this basket full of apples. You know, take the tractor ride back, had a good old time, got lots of pictures, a lot of fun, right? We get back. And, and, and the lady weighs the apples. I think it costs us 20 bucks, right, for a whole basket. The lady's like, hey, you get the whole basket for $20. And mom's like, oh, we're going to make so many apple pies. It's going to be absolutely awesome, right? And then the lady goes, by the way, we're having a special today. If you'd like a secondary basket already picked for you for $10, we can do that. You can add it to your, to your cart today. She said, yes. She said, yes. I was like, mom, you got a whole basket full of apples for 20 bucks. She goes, but I know, but I can get a whole another basket for just $10. I said, that's a lot of apples. She goes, that's a lot of apple pies. And that's how we did it. And I was like, why am I seeing this right now? Like, like I, ever, I always question myself. You know, Jim Rohn talks about, you know, where he was turn, turn, turn frustrating things into fascinating things. Turn, turn frustration into fascination. And, and when you do that, you can learn. Right. It's, it's so amazing because, you know, I was, he talks about how he was on the way to the, to the Los Angeles airport for, for a flight. He's, 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 it leaves in an hour and he's stuck in traffic waiting for the flight, going to almost miss the flight. And he was fascinated because he could learn from that experience, right? And I thought that was remarkable. That's a nice it, reframe. It absolutely is. And so anytime now that I find myself getting frustrated, I turn it around to fascination. You know, how can I become fascinated around this? Like why? I'm frustrated for sure. But how can I become fascinated? Because it totally shifts you, like you just said, into thinking, what's the real problem here? What's the real solution here? Why am I frustrated? What created this frustration in the first place? And why is it here now? Right. And what can I go back to or what can I change to make sure there's no more longer frustration? It's just fascination. Yeah. And so one of those things you're basically saying, is, one of those things is just to keep, keep it simple, right? Keep the funnel simple. It's going to cause less ripples, less challenges, be able yeah. to just focus. Um, and so, and I think that's a huge part of scaling is being able to, like you said, keep things under control. Um, one of the other hurdles that a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with, right, is okay. They think they have a converting offer. Maybe they're stuck back in an era when, or whatever their platform is in the, that's similar to the era of when you were on Facebook, only allowing you to do 
thousand dollars a day or whatever it was. Um, what, uh, and you've, you've often looked at different traffic sources and ways and you shared this story at dream 100 con, but, uh, about like, you know, you buying all of an email list and then being capped out and then going to affiliates. Um, what's the first traffic source that you recommend after leaving like the main guys of Facebook and Google? Ooh, that's a great question. So I love email. Email is really great because it's a dedicated email. And what I mean by that, if you've never done that is basically you just call somebody with a list that has your avatar, who has your client database and ask them if you can pay them to send an email to their email database with your offer. It's really all it is. There's people out there that are more than willing to do that. There's a lot of people who are not willing to do that. And those people are naive. <laughs> <laughs> To know, to know what's up. We call, we call those people naive. So I love that. Yeah, it's big. It'd be like, I mean, that's just that there's, there's, dude, there's people out there that think that the people on their list are only on their list. Right. They only get emails from me and they look forward to them. I can't make it to where I give them something else that's interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And, no, I agree. And, and it, there's obviously people like that, but there are a lot of people out there that, uh, well, there's one, there's just kind of the, the Dream 100 style, right? Of, finding someone that maybe isn't in the business of marketing their list, but you can create a relationship with and help them do that. Um, and then there's also, right. The guys who they're in the business of selling and doing lists. Um, yeah. what, uh, you, you've had some huge success there, uh, you know, through having people, you know, do emails. I think that's, uh, yeah. that's where your license plate even comes from, right? Uh, no, the license plate, where's that darn license? Oh yeah. I actually got one. Hold on. Nice. Don't you, don't you know it? We gotta have, we gotta have it. We got, we got one. I didn't know you wanted to see it. There we go. That's awesome. There's the Missouri license plate. If you need to look me up, run my light, run my plates. There you go. <laughs> so the good old Kaching. So this is actually what's, so what's funny about the Kaching is the, the Kaching on it, uh, what actually represented, uh, the noise that our app would make. So I, I, I think it was called pushover at the time or something like that. Right. Basically, it sends an email. So every time you get a payment, you get an email, and then that email forwards onto this email address, and then your, which is the app, and then the app makes a sound effect of ka-ching, cash register. Right. It sounds beautiful, by the way. It's a great, like, very hardcore, like, ka-ching. And it's absolutely phenomenal. And, and um, so anyways, when I got the Maserati in the, in the license plate, it, it doesn't mean, like, the car is ka-ching, right? Because a lot of people will come up to me like, I love how the license plate goes with the car, but realistically, the license plate is not for the car. It's actually for me. And right. it's, it's just a symbol and memory of, uh, you know, what we did and what we have and what we've built from one t-shirt to one funnel to, you know, the, the, to everything that it became. And it's cool because, you know, who would have thunk, but more, more people talk about this license plate than anything I've ever had and done. You know, like, like when I'll go to the car wash, you have to enter and you have, they have to write down your, your license plate. And I think I get a lot of, a lot of comments there just to talk about it. Like, oh man, the license plate, love the license plate. But it's just a great reminder. Like what they're really doing is they're reminding me of my past and my future. Sure. You know? It's a really cool, it's a really cool thing. I, I really in, enjoy having it. But yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah I, cool. I, uh, I think it's important for us to have reminders and anchors like that because uh, we learn all these amazing things, but then we're, we get back into real life, right? And every once in a while, we need to be reminded of, of kind of that current, right? Jumping back in the, mm -hmm. the current and and like one, keep, I don't think you have this issue, but I've seen some people struggle with like keeping the, keeping the intensity, right? Keeping the growth, uh, con constantly looking for what is the next, like as their paradigm shift, keep looking up instead of like complacency. Um, I don't think that's a challenge that you have, but. Uh, you know, I've seen it in, in my life as like different things become really important. I've got four kids and, you know, it, you got to manage a lot of different things. What, uh, what's your advice to, you know, to someone who's maybe in the middle of one of those uh, challenges of their business, they've got their business figured out, but they're trying to figure out how to go and take it to the next level. Man, that's a, that's a good question. Cause it really depends on where they're at. Right. Sure. Um, Cause you could be, you could be doing, $10,000 a month and want to know how to get to $100,000 a month. Or you could be at $100,000 a month wanting to do a million dollars a month or a million to, you know, Wolf Wall Street stuff, $4 million, $5 right. million a month. And, you know, they, 
You know, I've, I was actually contemplating about this um, yesterday, ironically enough. And I always think about the title of uh, what got you here won't get you there. I haven't read the book, but the title, I think, explains a lot. Yeah, you're good from that. Yeah. And so, so my question is, is, I asked myself this question is, what habits do I need to currently change to uh, deliver myself into the future? Right? So what habits am I currently doing now that are holding me back from the next level? Right? So for instance, maybe I'm sleeping in. Maybe I'm leaving work too early. Maybe I'm not concentrating on uh, what I need to be concentrating on. Right? Maybe my focus isn't in the right place. But the, the, the thing is, is you have to have standards of every day and then you have to have habits of every day to get you to that next piece. And this is what I was really, I was just taking a lot of time yesterday of just really trying to figure out what, what are those new habits, right? What habits should I create? What standards should I create on a daily basis that I just hold true to that are going to get me to that next level? And some, you know, some were, you know, I, I, I wake up at 5 a.m. I hate waking up at 5 a.m. Hate it, right? I'm not, a, I'm not a morning guy. I used to be a night dude, right? Stay up till midnight, stay up till two. I'd be doing calculus until like three in the morning, drinking coffee, have the shakes, and then have an exam the next day at, at eight, eight o'clock or nine o'clock and then come home and pass out. I did college, right? I, I cheated my way through college. So it wasn't even, well, I didn't even get the right degree. So, you know, Look at a true story. So, you know, it's interesting how you look at that is, is what, what got you here is definitely not going to get you to the next stop, right? You need, you need to switch gears a little bit. And sometimes I don't necessarily know if that's learning a new hack, right? Or, or downloading a shiny object uh, course or figuring out um, how to manage better. You know, sometimes I think it just has, has to do with, you know, your self-worth and like where you're headed and in how thankful you are, how dedicated you are, and who you're, who, who you're trying to be. And so some of the things that I'm, that I'm looking at right now is, um, you know, I actually wrote them down, hold on. So that way I can, and, and then basically you gotta, you gotta look at holding these every day, right? So right. One, one of the, some, some of mine were, um, you know, wake up at 5 a.m. Because what I had trouble with is, if I didn't have something set in stone for 5 a.m. the next day, like a podcast to listen to, a book to read, um, something to do, then what I find myself doing is I'll wake up at 5 a.m., the alarm clock will go off. And in my mind, I'm like, you know, I don't really have much to do this morning. I'll probably just go back to sleep, get another couple hours of sleep and wake up at seven. Or I have something big that day. Like I'll have a big meeting, right? right. Or a big, a big um, event, whatever. And I'll say to myself, you know what? I need to sleep in more uh, right now because I need to be more alert and awake during that event. So I'm making excuses, right? I'm not holding myself to standards. And what I put was, you know, I'm going to wake up at 5 a.m. even if it's just to sit outside and watch the sunrise. So even if that's the only thing I'm doing today, it's worth waking up at 5 a.m. And so that's what I looked at. That's a standard. The next thing is, is, I, is I, um, I take Liam to school every day. And so, you know, how I take Liam to school is, is a standard, should be a standard, right? What do I talk about? What do we talk about, right? Some days, some days we don't talk about much, right? There's nothing, I mean, he's five, he just turned five. So right. sometimes, you know, we're talking about how the trees smell or how green it is outside, you know? What the, what, and then another day we were talking about loans of all things and how a loan works and what money is. Right. And, you know, obviously that was probably a little harder for him to uh, understand. But then later that night, he asked me for a loan. So maybe, maybe he got it. <laughs> and, you know, things like that, like what affirmations, what stories do I want to tell him? What, 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 what do we want to listen to? What kind of tapes do we want to listen to? Um, the, the other thing I want to say is I want to I start deleting and conquering emails the night before the next day. You know, big thing with me is I'll get in the morning and I'll find I'm an hour into the day. And I'm just drowning in emails. 
So for the last month and a half, I've been unsubscribing to everybody. So if I've unsubscribed for you, it's not you, it's me, okay? I even put that in the comments. Yeah. I'm like, they're like, why are you unsubscribing? I'm like, bro, it's not you, it's me, okay? Just let, that, let's that, let you know that. I'm just, I'm just redoing my standards right now. I, uh, I did something similar just recently, and I found I couldn't keep up with the unsubscribes. So I literally yeah. just created a filter in my email that anything with the word unsubscribe into it goes into a different <laughs> folder and skips the inbox. That's and cool. it's been, it's been massive because like, then I can go in there deliberately and like look for things, but it doesn't get come. It doesn't reach front and center. So it's that's been, a freaking great hack. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. That's amazing. Cause I, I've tried, uh, I've tried unroll and I've tried all yeah. these things, but you have to actively do it. And that, that yes. active, it, yeah. So it just, it was the fastest route to clarity for me. That's so smart. Um, so here's, here's, I think the biggest one though. It, well, maybe there's two, there should be, there's two here. So daily standards, actually there's three, good Lord. There's a lot. <laughs> so some good standards. So now the, the other standard was, uh, or one of them. So, so what I do is I create, uh, my day or well, hold on. I work out around my day versus, versus, uh, working around my workout. So what's interesting about entrepreneurs and, and, and how we, you know, we'll burn the candle at both ends. We'll freaking do sleepless nights. You know, we'll go crazy, right? We're entrepreneurs. We're like, it's, it's what the, it's what everybody, all the social media is showing you to do, right? You need the Lambo. You need the, you need the million dollar house. You need to be the entrepreneur that's in the parking lot up late, you know, up early, stay late, like that kind of dude, right? You got to go, go, go. And we get fed that stuff and then we go crazy. But, you know, what's interesting is you, you start to degrade your temple. Your body's your temple, man. Some dude looked at me one day, his name was Alex Sharfin. And he points at me and he goes, Trey, you are a $30 million racehorse. Treat yourself like one. And I was like, damn, Sharfin, that was some intense, deep, shit right there. And, you know, and you think about that, you're like, if I had a $30 million racehorse, that dude would be, you know, he'd be, he'd be working out. He'd be eating right. He'd be, he'd be educated. He'd be learning how to run properly. And when you are the $30 million racehorse, it's a lot different, right? Oh, you know, that little chocolate over there, that little donut over there looks, that little alcohol over there looks, looks mighty fine. You know, I'm socially being acceptable, right? By, by having a drink with you. Right. So anyways, I think a lot of that revolves around, you know, my workout revolves around my work versus my work revolves around my workout. And that's something I want to change, you know, my, in my daily standard of practice is I want to have a set workout and my work evolves, revolves around that. And that is because I'm here for the temple. I'm here for good graces. And I'm here to, you know, become somebody, right? And not just somebody, but um, a, 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 a being of something, right? Something who's strong and powerful and, and healthy and fit. Like, I want to have all that. So um, that's a big one. And then the other one was, um, you know, it, th something else I want to schedule around is schedule a time for peace of reading and just becoming educated. You know, that's something I've slacked on. I need to get back into it. And these are big reminders. One thing we do on the Commerce Kings podcast is I always ask all, any of, anyone I interview, the number one question I ask them is, what's the number one book, right? What's the number one book that changed your life? And dude, I got to tell you, my bookshelf went from a fluffy pillow to solid rocks. I'm telling you, the books are so heavy. They're so rich. They're so deep. And it's, they're, they're the, best, the best of the best books because I've taken someone else's lifetime to find that one book and he's willing to give me that, that gym, that value and say, you know what, of all my books, this is the one, this is the one that changed my life. Right. And then I get to read that book that changed his life. And then I get to read another book that changed that dude's life and another book that changed that. I'm telling you, the books on my shelf now, it's, they're, they're, they're individual miracles. It's, they're absolutely awesome. stunning. And so I want to evolve around that. And then the last one, I know this kind of, we went real deep here. That's okay. Uh, and I had the list, so now you got it. Yeah. The other big thing was, and this, this is uh, Brian Tracy all day long. A really good book from Brian Tracy is, I got it on my uh, quick here. Let's see. Where is he at? Find your balance point. 
So find your balance point by Brian Tracy to get the audible. It'll take you an hour and 20 minutes to go through at 1.5 X. It's absolutely great. Change your life. It's how millionaires are born. But at the, at the, at the, I guess, whatever, at the center of it, create three tasks tonight that you're going to complete tomorrow. Dude, I can't tell you how many days I go home and I ask myself, what in the hell did I do today? Yeah. Dude, I ask myself that and it pisses me off because I'm like, I just wasted a freaking day. Right? We only got 30,000 days on this earth, man. Right. And there it went. You know, Jay Abraham has this really cool thing where um, he has a jar, he has a big jar and it's full of blue marbles. And every Saturday, he takes a marble out and throws it in the trash. Just remind himself that he's got only those marbles left and he needs to make something of them. Yeah, that's pretty powerful stuff. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, I appreciate you sharing that list, by the way. I think that's really neat. And I think I've heard the, I, I was reading in one of Joe Polish's books uh, about the, the million dollar or the $30 million racers. You're apparently 30 times more valuable, but I like it. And I love that <laughs> concept because I think we, we oftentimes uh, as entrepreneurs, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves for like the mission. But I think that's a short term win, right? You can maybe do that for a week or maybe, maybe even a month. But uh, I know anytime that I've let myself slip and I, I went through that through a recent, you know, experience, um, it ends up catching back up to you. And so maintaining that balance, maintaining that uh, with the priority of the self is, is really important. Mm. Um, and the, the last thing I want to bring up with you is uh, I've noticed in, in a lot of your conversations that the, the value of mentorship and the value of experts, the value of men, of uh, having people around you to help you kind of show you the way, right? Like, uh, you know, you've gone, you, you value masterminds, you value those kinds of things. Um, what, uh, how has, how did you one first like get into that? And then two, like, how has that, uh, how has that impacted your life and business? Well, it was sure easier going through mentors than it was learning about myself. You know, one, one thing, one thing I tell people is it'll cost you far greater more money to learn it yourself than it will just to buy the expensive mentors because I've already done it. You know, they already know the, the stuff and a lot of people say I can't afford it. And realistically, you are going to for it one way or another. It's just how long it's going to take you to get there. So let's say, let's say a mentor was 20 grand, okay? So a mentor might give you his, his whole year for 20 grand, but you say, you know, I don't, I don't got 20 grand. And I get that. Some people don't have 20 grand. So they'll take the next three years spending that 20 grand, figuring out what that mentor would have given them maybe in six or seven months. Right. They're going to amortize right. it and self-finance to self-learn instead of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that, that's a good question, man, is because when I was a young kid, um, there was no Facebook yet. I mean, Facebook came out when I was in college, so there right. was no face, there was no Facebook. Um, there was uh, probably that MySpace thing or whatever. I wasn't a part of that. I had Yahoo messenger. I was that guy. Yep. But I didn't read the wall street journal. I didn't read paper. I lived in a small town, moved to St. Louis, you know, saw kind of bigger things, but nothing like, you know, you see in Miami or, you see in California, like the big mother effing mansions and the big mother effing yachts and the big, you know, jets and stuff like that. Yeah. Like St. Louis doesn't have that stuff. And so it's hard to, hard to visualize those big goals. You see them in pictures and magazines and frames. But one thing I did say to myself is, you know, I wish I could have a mentor. Like I wish somebody would mentor me and I'm just, I'm like, God send somebody down, you know, give me somebody. And no one came <laughs> for like the longest time. Unless I didn't see it, you know, my, my go along with the, the three ships God sent to the guy drowning in the ocean. Right. But, but at the end of the day, um, I must, I might've missed those ships or maybe it just wasn't my time. And it's kind of like they say, right. The mentor will show up when you're ready. But I, my, my first, one of my first mentors was this guy named Adam. And we we're at this convention and Adam's like, Hey, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to, you know, I want to make money online. He's like, okay, I can teach you how to do that. I said, man, that's perfect. I've been looking for you. He's like, yeah, but it's going to be, you know, two grand a month. I was like, dude, I don't, I don't got two grand a month. I barely, I barely make three grand a month with the insurance I'm doing. And he goes, yeah, okay, I understand. But what was cool about him was he was relentless for some reason. I don't know what it was about him, but he was, he was relentless on getting that 2K from me. 
And we, we were texting. I think I have a flip phone at the time, like this little stupid flip phone. I'm like, you know, right. doing my two thumbs. And I remember the text to this day where, where, where he goes, are you in, you out? And I go, I'm out. And he replies, dude, that's going to be the biggest mistake you make. Oh, wow. Not letting me show you the way, the mentoring way. I said, you're, he goes, you're risking $2,000. And I go, damn. I said, I'm in. I said, you know what? Screw it. I'm in. And dude, me making that, I don't know what made me make that decision. Um, Cause I definitely didn't have an ego. I definitely wasn't like big headed cause I didn't know anything. I was just like, I need help. But I didn't want to figure it. I didn't want to go figure it out. I didn't want to pay for a mentor either. Right? Like I was just in this, in this corner and I don't know what made me make that decision, but I did. And it showed me that paying someone to, to educate me got me somewhere much quicker, much faster. And it showed me that there are people out there that know way more than, than I thought I knew. Right. I didn't know how to do any of that stuff. They were doing magical things. And I was like, how do you even know how to do that? You know, it's crazy. Like so much technology with, with everything that's being built right. to this day, things are changing so fast that I can't keep up with all, you know, some of that stuff. And so I have to go get other mentors. I'm like, dude, how are you doing that? How are you doing Instagram right now, man? Like you're doing some amazing things on Instagram. And then I, you know, I just met a guy um, the other day who, who's just, you know, creating a big awareness around his name. And I said, dude, what are you doing? He goes, man, I got this machine. It's cost me 20 grand a month, but it's just getting my name out there. I'm like, geez, teach me the machine. I want to know the machine. And, you know, cause I don't have that machine. I want that machine. Give me that machine. He's like, well, it's going to cost you. I said, I'm willing to pay, you know, I learned my lesson back in 2000, whatever that was. Right. So, so yeah, man, it was, it was just a decision that I had to make. And, you know, unfortunately you're going to have mentors who might not teach you anything um, that you, maybe you thought would, that they were going to teach you. Maybe they teach you something else that you didn't even realize they taught you until maybe years later. Um, other people are probably not the mentors you thought they are. And there's other mentors that, um, will over deliver and under promise and you'll be, you know, forever grateful. But the thing is, is you don't know who's who until you go through a lot of them. Right. And just kind of, you know, every year you're just kind of learning something new from different mentors. And, you know, I'll, I'll go back to mentors I've had, you know, cause they got something new up and running. They got something new. They found something new. That's awesome. I'm like, dude, what, what, whoa, whoa, Hey, what are you doing now? What, what's that? And keep in touch. And so it's not like, you know, if you stop using a mentor, it's, you know, that's gone forever. You can always come back and stay friends and, right. and, and still learn from another. And then what's fun is, um, this is always fun too, is because I've had people who have mentored me and then like three years later, they're enrolling into our mentorship and we're mentoring them. And it's like, it's pretty cool. You know, it's pretty cool to see that. It's like, wow, I get to teach you something. Like, man, I, I, I totally am grateful because of that, because you taught me so much and now I get to give that back, right? In different ways. So, yeah. And I think, you ways. know, that, that's fascinating how that does happen where, and I think the people who I've seen who are, are really, truly successful are willing to, willing to do two things, uh, willing to learn from anybody, right? Even if there's no ego of like, well, I'm farther along than they are. And, mm -hmm. uh, and two, willing to like discuss their failures in the same amount of energy as, as their, as their success. Cause they both know, they know that all of those things are in the past. Yep. And so that they don't have any value. They're just things that happened in the past and not the future you're creating. Um, and so to me, all of this, like everything that we do in entrepreneurship is to give us the lifestyle that we want and whether that's, uh, you know, riches or adventure or whatever it is, what's one major item on your personal bucket list you're going to do in the next 12 months, not business related. Oh man, I got that. That was all yesterday, bro. Oh, <laughs> you should, you should have been there. Should have been there. That was it. Was an it was an incredible day, um, man. What was what was some of the things on the list? What some of them? So I'm planning out my 2019 right now, and I wanna I wanna travel six times. That's uh, I think we did like four this year, four or five. Like it's really we're really like on the crest of six. So we, we probably would have made it. But I wanna do I wanna do at least six, one every other month you know, about a week vacation. Some are big, some are not, some are easy, some are fun, some are, some are exhilarating, some are silly, some are extravagant. Yep. So there's all different levels that I go on, uh, which is really cool. Some that we, like one will be full nine yard, crazy, just 
kings and queen kind of feel, right? And others will be a little, a little weekend trip to a beach, right? Because right? we're in the middle of St. Louis. So those are usually in the winter months when it's super cold here and you're like, you just need sun. Right. Um, you know, what, you know here's, here's a really cool thing that I'll, I don't know if I'll do in the next 12 months, but it's something that's definitely on that list which is, and it might be 2019, who knows, but you fly, you should check this on YouTube. It's so cool. You, it's in Russia. I think it's in, it's near Moscow, um, Moscow and you take a, a fighter jet. Do you know about this? No, not yet. Uh, okay. So I think it's 16 grand. So you take a fighter jet and they, they zip you up to the earth's crest of the atmosphere. And it's right between the layer of, I don't know the layers, but the layer of basically you burn up to shrivelines and the hemisphere of the earth. Okay. Right. So you get to fly on the, like the crest of that atmosphere. Yeah. Like not quite outer space, right? Inner space, whatever they call that. You're right there. Yeah. yeah. But what you get to see is you get to see the curvature of the actual earth. And you, ba you basically get to fly in, into space for That's about six months. Awesome. And Dude, I've watched a couple YouTube videos on it, and it's yeah, it's pretty remarkable. That's so pretty it's de cool. It's definitely on the list. I was showing Jen the other night. Um, the other thing I want to do is there's a castle in Germany, and it's called the like Nuschinschwin Castle or something like that. And I got to get the name down. Yeah, it's all right. It's the most, it's the most beautiful castle I think. You can eat, you can Google. Uh, uh, beautiful castles and it's pretty much the majority of those images it's the most beautiful castle and i want to go see that because it's it's one of my it's one of my goals to either purchase a castle or i'm going to build a castle and i think like if there was ever if i was ever in a past life because if like if you watch what's been happening in my life like things have just been kind of happening like for some reason i have commerce kings I have the crown. I have, yeah. so I don't know if in a past life, like I was some sort of king and now I'm on this virtue to go get my castle back or something like that. <laughs> but like something internally in me is like, you need the castle, you need the crown, you need to go. Yep. And we're, we're definitely on our way, right? We got the name at least down. Now we got to go spend some money, <laughs> get the damn castle. But I think it'd be super cool to either buy one or build one. And then, you know, how you'd monetize it is like put weddings in it and, yeah. Uh, you know, business retreats and stuff like that and rent it out. But to own and to monetize and to flourish and to have your own castle would be pretty on the legit table. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, so that's I one love, of those. Not in probably 12 months, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, well, I, look, crazier things have been done. So, but, yeah. uh, so I want to appreciate you. Like, first of all, like this is a, a longer than normal episode, but I was enjoying it so much. I'm like, dude, We'll have to cut it down when it goes on to ABC News, but we'll leave it. We'll let it run long for the podcast. So, um, just want to say, you know, thank you for that, and appreciate all the listeners out there. Um, learn more, please, from Trey. Go to treylewellen.com. Uh, subscribe to his Commerce Kings podcast. Uh, check out his mentorship. Check out all the stuff he's got going on. He's got some really cool free funnels there. Um, but Trey, tons of appreciation and gratitude for uh, coming on and sharing so much so freely. Oh, hey, thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Now, all of you listening, it's your turn. Go out and do something.